happy Sabbath. How are you all? And I hope you all will enjoy this Sabbath day. Do you know that Sabbath is a sanctuary, but it's a time sanctuary. On the seventh day, it doesn't matter wherever you are in Asia, in Europe, or here, we can just enter into this time sanctuary. And also this weekend is Mother's Day. And all of you mother out there, I wish you happy Mother's Day. And I pray tonight that God will continue to bless each one of you, bless each of you with his love, with his joy, and with his peace. Tonight, we're going to continue to study this book, Christ Object Lesson. And we've been studying talents. Last week, the study was about time management and health management. And the week before, we talked about the ability to influence others through our knowledge and through our speech. And tonight, we're going to continue to talk about talents, especially about multiplying our given talents. And this time is about developing our strength. We're not talking about physical strength. It's about the good qualities and good attributes that God has given us. And after that, we're going to talk about money, how to use our money to serve God. Strength. What did the Bible say about strength? The Bible said we are to love God, not only with all the heart, all the mind, all the soul, but also with all the strength. This means employing the full intelligent usage of our entire being to love God. There are a few points that I would like to use to demonstrate what it means by multiplying our strength talent. Do you know Jesus demonstrated this Bible verse, loving God with his entire being. You know that when he was growing up, the people had seen him toiling, meaning working very hard, up and down the hills in Nazareth, serving his earthly father, Joseph the carpenter. And after he turned 30, he continued to toil day and night. But now he is he was to heal and to teach, to serve his heavenly Father. So on earth, Christ was a faithful worker in secular things as well as in spiritual things. In all his work, he determined to do his Father's will. So there's no separation between secular work and spiritual work. Do you know that the things between heaven and earth are more closely linked together than you and I ever realized? Let me give you some examples. There was a tabernacle in the wilderness, right? And it was not Moses or Israelites' invention. It was Christ's design, following God's will. And it was Christ who gave the instruction to Moses. And also, do you remember the famous Solomon's temple? It was so glorious and magnificent. But it was not Solomon's ingenious idea. He didn't have the capability to think up this temple. It was Christ who gave him the instruction and specification. Christ, the one who worked as the Nazarene carpenter in the earth, was the heavenly architect who planned out the details for the sacred buildings where his name was to be honored. Moreover, the Bible said it was Christ who gave the builders of the tabernacle wisdom to carry out the most skillful and beautiful workmanship. In Exodus 31, 2-6, this is what he said. He says, See, I have called thy name Bezaliel, the son of Uri, 
the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and have filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom and in understanding, and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, I have given him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom, that they may make all that I have commanded thee. You see how involved Christ was in building the tabernacle. Another point. We, as God's worker, whether in our learning, our planning, our creation, or just improvement of a project, every detail of the process, we need to look to God, who is the giver of everything including wisdom, ability, and strength. We often admire the skillful touch of a surgeon, his manipulation over blood vessels, nerves, and muscles, and the doctor's excellent knowledge of our delicate organism in our body. Do you know that all this wisdom and ability are given by God? God provides this talent so that he can use it for those who are suffering. Even the skill of carpenter, how he used the hammer, and even the strength of the metal worker, how he cuts or mold the metal, they all come from God. God has endowed man with talents and he expects him to look to him for advice and wisdom so that man may use his strength to serve him and to benefit humanity. Let me reiterate, whatever we do, in whatever department of work we are placed, God likes to use us to do perfect work to serve him and to benefit humanity. So, religion and secular work are not two separate things. They are one. Bible religion is to be intertwined with all we do and all we say. Divine activities and human activities are to work together for success. They are joined efforts in all human pursuits in whatever field whether in mechanical, engineering, agricultural work, in business, or scientific endeavors, there must be cooperation between God and man, as in Christian activities. So how can we achieve this? How do we cooperate with God? The author said, we can achieve this by keeping in mind that in all we do, we are to glorify God, to show his love, and to work according to his will. As so we are taking part in a religious service. In working this way, God will build our character. And we will grow in his grace and knowledge. Another point. God will not accept the greatest talent on earth or the most splendid service unless self, this self here, is laid aside as living sacrifice on the altar of God. Our heart has to be holy or else the result from our work would not be acceptable to God. Do you remember the story of Daniel and Joseph? I'm sure you do. The Lord made both of them astute managers with sound judgments because they did not live to please themselves, to please their own inclination, but to please God. So God worked through them. The case of Daniel has a great lesson for us all. It reveals the fact that a political leader is not necessarily just a sharp policy man. Well, Daniel was sharp and wise in judgment, but that's not all. 
he also had integrity. He pleased God. He accepted God's instruction at every step. So he was also a prophet of God, receiving the light of heavenly inspiration. The Bible said, worldly ambitious statesmen or politician, a trend seemed, lasting only a short time, just like the grass and the flowers. But yet, the Lord wants those who are intelligent in his service, just like Daniel. And also, other lines of work, he also called men who are willing to build up the kingdom of God. They have opportunity to do great work if they are willing to follow God. And they will become more wise and more efficient, just like Daniel and Joseph. You know, Daniel, in all his dealings, in all his relationships, when subjected to close scrutiny, no one could find fault or error in him. He was an example of every man who may become if he totally lay aside himself and totally dedicated. Now, the author is going to talk about money as talent. Well, God also entrusts man with financial means. He gives him power to get wealth. So even the ability to be rich is a blessing from God. Just like with the water and the sun, he used them to benefit and sustain life on earth and making the things in nature to flourish and bear fruits. So he also asks those who are blessed with financial means to use them to serve God and to bless man. Let me read a quote from the author. Our money has not been given us that we might honor and glorify ourselves. As faithful stewards, we are to use it for the honor and glory of God. Some think that only a portion of the means is the Lord's. After they have set apart a portion for religious and charitable purposes, they regard the remainder as their own, to be used as they see fit. But in this, they mistake. All we possess is the Lord's, and we are accountable to Him for the use we make of it. In the use of every penny, it will be seen whether we love God supremely and our neighbor as ourselves. Money has great value because it can do great good. In the hands of God's children, it is also food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, and clothes for the naked. It is a defense for the oppressed and a means for help to those who are sick. Money can become of no more value like the sand unless it is put to use in providing the necessities of life, in blessing others and in advancing the cause of Christ. The author added more points. She said, hoarded wealth is not merely useless. It is a curse. It can become a trap or a snare to the soul. How so? Well, it can draw our affections away from the heavenly treasure. It can draw us away from God. It can lure us away from what is important in this life and the life after. In the judgment day, we will have to give account of what has been given to us, whether we have used it according to his will, God's will. James 5, 1 to 4, the Bible says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You will heaped up treasure in the last days. 
indeed the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the lords of Sabbath. Jesus does not encourage extravagant lifestyle or careless use of our financial means. He gave us examples of how to manage our resources carefully. Do you remember the Bible story of Jesus feeding the 5,000? After everyone was satisfied and contented, what did Jesus tell the disciples to do? Let me read. Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. John 6, 12. This is a lesson for all his followers. He who realizes that his money is a talent from God will use it economically and will feel that it is a duty to save so that he might give and benefit others. God knows that the more we use our money for showy purpose and self-indulgence, the further away we will drift from him. Moreover, the more we waste our money, the less we will have to feed the hungry and clothe the naked. The author said, every penny used unnecessarily deprives the spender of a precious opportunity of doing good. It is robbing God of the honor and glory which should flow back to him through the improvement of his entrusted talents. Wow. Now we're going to study about another type of talents, kindly impulses and affections. You know, this is new to me. It says having the quality of being kind, affectionate, and generous is a talent. And quick understanding of spiritual things is also a precious talent. They also said these are endowed by God and are not there by accident. She also said those who possess this talent have responsibilities. Because like all other talents, they need to use them to serve God. But in reality, although some knows they have these positive qualities, but they are using them in a limited fashion, perhaps only to their friends and the family. And they are not actively putting these talents to everyone within their reach. They tell themselves that if they have opportunity, if circumstances are favorable, they would do a great and good work. But at the meantime, they are inactively waiting for the opportunity to arrive. And they might ignore that poor beggar and despise those who they deem as unworthy. At the same time, they feel they are good, that they are better than their mean neighbor. The author said they are deceiving themselves. I quote her. Those who possess Large affections are under obligation to God to bestow them, not merely on their friends, but on all who need their help. Social advantages are talents and are to be used for the benefit of all within reach of your influence. The love that gives kindness to only a few is not love, but selfishness. It will not in any way work for the good of souls or the glory of God. Those who thus leave the master's talents unimproved are even more guilty than are the ones for whom they feel such contempt. To them it will be said, you knew your master's will, but did it not. Wow, that's an awakening message. To sum up, talents used will be talents multiplied. Success from our endeavors is not resolved by chance or of destiny. 
It is the working power provided by God. And it is the reward from practicing faith and care, goodness and perseverance. When we use every gift we have, we shall have greater gifts to share. This is what the author said. God does not supernaturally endow us with the qualification we lack, like magically giving us this talent or that talent. It doesn't happen that way. But it happens when we use what we have. Then God will work with us to increase and strengthen our every physical and mental power. In another word, when we are committed and sincere to sacrifice ourselves to serve our master, our talents will increase. So what does self-sacrifice mean? Well, it is when we surrender our entire being as instruments for the Holy Spirit. What happens when we surrender to the working power of the Holy Spirit? The grace of God will work within us so that we can refuse to give in to our old inclination. The old habits or old inclination are the ones that hold us back from achieving bigger things. And the Holy Spirit will help us to overcome those negative, clinging tendency of ours to form new beneficials and righteous habits. As we continue to appreciate and obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit, our hearts will increase its capacity to receive more and more of His power and to do more and better work our dormant or sleeping energies will be aroused and be awakened. And the mental or physical power that has been paralyzed because of sin will receive new life. That means when we obediently respond to the call of God to serve Him, we may be sure to receive divine assistance. Moreover, in accepting so great and holy a responsibility will elevate our character, meaning it will strengthen and purify our mind and our heart. Through faith in the power of God, it is amazing how strong a weak man may become, how purposeful he turned into, and how productive he will grow to be as a result. I will quote the author again. He who begins with a little knowledge in a humble way and tells what he knows while seeking diligently for further knowledge will find the whole heavenly treasure awaiting his demand. The more he seeks to impart light, the more light he will receive. The more one tries to explain the word of God to others with the love for souls, the plainer it becomes to himself. The more we use our knowledge and exercise our powers, the more knowledge and power we shall have. Wow, amazing. Besides using our talent to share the gospel, we can also share Christ by bearing others' burdens through prayers. When we do that, our own hearts will pulsate with the quickening influence of God's grace. Our own affections will multiply and glow with more divine zeal, enthusiasm. Our whole Christian life will be more of a reality, more sincere and more prayerful. The author said the value of man is estimated in heaven according to the capacity of the heart to know God. Let me say it again. The author said the value of man is estimated in heaven according to the capacity of the heart to know God. It is because the more we know God, the more we realize 
how much He loves us and wants to bless us. This knowledge, knowledge of God, is the spring that flows all power. Do you know that God created man in the way that our mental faculties may be like the faculty of the divine mind? Let me read it again. Do you know that God created man in the way that our mental faculties may be like the faculties of the divine mind. God is at all times seeking to bring human mind in union with His. Can you imagine that? God offers us the privilege to cooperate with Christ. To do what? To reveal His grace to the world. Can you imagine working with Christ? And do you know, when we keep on seeking and sharing, we will receive increased knowledge of heavenly things. Furthermore, by beholding Him, we become changed. Beholding means keep watching Him, keep seeking Him, because He impresses us by beholding we become changed. Being good, loving our fellow man, all these will become natural to us and we will grow into Christ's likeness. As our capacity to know God enlarge, more and more we will enter into spiritual fellowship with the heavenly world. Can you imagine that? And the author said, we will have increasing power to receive, receiving the riches of the knowledge and wisdom of eternity. How wonderful, how amazing it would be. Next week, we're going to talk about the servant who buried that one talent. And what does that mean to us? Happy Sabbath.